Recording in progress. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Okay. What am I looking at? What am I looking at? What am I looking at? Tumor in the liver? <laughs> Hope not. Liver is kind of the other side. This is the liver. It it does continue on, but not in this this particular slice. So that's that's another. You see the liver showing up here. That's a further slice. What is that? Hmm. Come on. What, what's in your stomach? This, by the way, it's the stomach. That's the liver, that's the heart. That's the uh, whatever, uh, you know, the colon. What's this? The guy drank some gadolinium. First of all, how do you know it's a guy? Uh, because it was a volunteer last week and the probability is higher it was a guy. And the what? And the probability was higher that it was a guy. Okay. Because why, why it's a higher probability it's a guy? Got plenty of women in our group. Let's scan each other all the time. But uh, you do, I do agree with you that it's, uh, it's a volunteer. You can see the shoulders are really wide and the waist is really narrow. You're saying that's, that's a fit person. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that's, that's probably a swimmer. Looks like it, yeah. Probably a swimmer, yeah. Which means it's probably you. Probably. Because <laughs> it's BPT. Um, uh, that's not fair looking at uh, that, you know, our markers. All right. Anyway, well, what is this thing? I don't want to spend the entire class on this. Because I, I was worried. It's like, whoa, what's this bright thing? So I asked my uh, colleague. Uh, which you're going to meet on Thursday. And basically he said, that's a normal stomach. That's actually the, the stomach. And I don't know if you ever got a heartburn because of eating, you know, like stuff. And the reason it's called a heartburn is because it burns in your stomach, but the stomach is really close to the heart physically. And so it feels like your heart is burning, but it's really the stomach. Yeah? See? It's the heart. That's the stomach. Almost touching. You know, there is the, um, 
the uh, diaphragm, you know, separating, but you know, it's pretty close. Uh, also, one of the reasons that um, uh, pregnant women will have a, uh, a heartburn too is because all this thing is occupied with a baby. This is pushed up and then you try to breathe that pushes down and basically squeezes that thing and that sack, you know, puts whatever is inside out and so you uh, don't feel very well. All right, enough anatomy for today. Where were we? Something I think super important, right? Not very important, super important. And uh, something super important is What's going on? Wiki wiki. Woohoo. SNR. Oh, thank you. Yeah, SNR. That's right. Super important. Why? Because if you don't have it, you can't get images. And I don't know about you, imaging noise is not that fulfilling. I mean, yeah, you take one image of noise. I mean, it kind of, it doesn't never looks exactly the same as other images of noise, but kind of looks similar, right? To the eye, right? 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 Yeah, I mean, every noise image will be different, but not very interesting. So that's why we need SNR, signal to noise ratio. Otherwise, not gonna, well, what's going on? MRI, oh, woo. exciting, yay, end of the semester. I mean, like, I see the fatigue in your eyes. We should have had a midterm, um, I can. You know, that would definitely refresh them. You know, be engaged, you know, the fact that we didn't, I mean, I think it's a mistake now. But we did have a midterm. Yeah, like a harder midterm. Oh, thought it was we, pretty hot. I mean, the, the great, <laughs> The grading has not been done yet. I mean, it's yeah, it's true. <laughs> it takes us a long time to grade. Yeah, so it's difficult. All right. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, SNR. So we said uh, something about SNR. In SNR, uh, having a few sources. One of them is the uh, pretty much the noise in our hardware, and the other one is the noise generated by the body. And there was a question that um, there was a whole discussion that. Um, uh, email sent about that not all of you have been on uh, asking saying something about electrolytes you know in in uh, in the magnetic field but I have to say something this has nothing to do with the magnet the fact that uh, there is um, electronic noise and also electrolyte noise has nothing to do with the fact there is a magnetic field or gradient it's just pretty much inherent to charge carriers that would then produce, uh, you know, um, electric fields and magnetic fields that would then pick up by the quill. That's it. Um, it that, that's, that's pretty much it. So that exists even if there was no magnet, even if there was no RF excitation, you still get those sources of noise. So that is fundamental uh, to the fact that um, there is temperature. Okay, it's all temperature related. And it's the temperature of the body and it's the temperature of the, of the receiver coil. The rest of the temperature within the bore doesn't really contribute as much as actually the body itself and the actually hardware within, you know, within the um, received chain. Uh, all the rest of the stuff um, has, uh, has nothing to do necessarily with noise. Of course, you know, heating has, uh, has other things associated with it. Um, like more, you know, more resistivity, for example, in the gradient coils and that kind of stuff. But that, that's 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 pretty much it. And of course, uh, gradient coils can burn. Um, that's that's a, a consequence. Sometimes that happens too. Um, before they burn, they usually leak because they have cooling liquid inside of them, 
So when they crack, they start leaking. And that's why uh, the coolant usually has color such that you know that the gratings are leaking. And that's also very common. All right, so um, yeah, so here's, here's the model. And the model of our receiving chain is that you have uh, some coil and the coil can be pretty much modeled like a, in a, well, it's a resonant coil. So it's an inductor and capacitor in uh, parallel like that. Um, and, but, but pretty much you can think of it as, as an inductor. Um, and then there's the signal that's generated in the coil due to uh, the EMF, so the induction. Uh, and then the coil, of course, has some resistance. And with that resistance, there's associated noise process, okay? Uh, the resistivity. Now, the resistivity, part of it is due to losses of the coil. So this is uh, this component of resistance or losses are associated with the parts of, you know, just using copper. Copper doesn't have infinite resistivity. Uh, sorry, infinite conductance, right? Like okay, it has some resistivity associated with it. And uh, that gets worse and worse as you actually move up in frequency because of skin depth effect. Uh, fam everybody familiar with skin depth effect? Um, just a quick thing. So uh, when you actually look at currents through a conductor, um, when you uh, look at a, a DC current through a conductor, usually the entire conductor use it, you know, uh, is used in order to, to, to conduct electrons. Um, so the cross section, like uh, basically you can, you, can, um, you can think of the entire conductor as being used in order to flow this, those electrons. But as you uh, go to higher and higher frequencies, most of the uh, carriers, charge carriers actually are condensed to the edges. Uh, of the of the conductor and really the inside of the conductor is really not used um, for conducting electrons at high frequency and it's really just the um, the um, the edges of the conductor so that means that there is pretty much current uh, density increase as you increase the frequency and hence the um, the the losses of course increase in the same way okay so that that is associated with that okay um, so um, we have the losses in the coil, um, and that depends pretty much the you know the copper or whatever the inductors that you use, capacitors. They all have something uh, that that has uh, sources of loss. But then there's a loss in the sample, and this is actually very interesting. You take you take a coil like a resonant circuit, and uh, and then you look uh, off, often actually uh, when we actually characterize it then uh, the way to characterize it is what's called the return loss. So what you do is you inject uh, RF and you, uh, you kind of look at how much, um, what is the uh, power that you transmit versus how much is actually reflected back. Um, and at some frequency, if it's a resonant circuit, then most of the energy will actually go and be irradiated out as opposed to reflected back. So this is a very typical graph uh, where this, this direction is frequency. And here it's return loss, uh, return loss in dB usually in decibels. And there's one particular frequency which is resonance. And that's where the maximum uh, our RF power is actually uh, being uh, uh, transmitted by the coil as opposed to being reflected back into the transmitter. So that is, uh, that is the resonance frequency. And then um, what really affects the, uh, so if you actually have some loss associated with it, then the width, the width of this peak uh, will expand. And that's what's uh, known as the quality factor. So if you have something that looks like this, then that's a low quality factor system. So uh, you may have some resonance, but a lot of, um, a lot of uh, losses. Whereas if you have something that's very sharp and narrow like this one, then that means that it's a high Q and there's very little loss associated with it. 
Well, you, uh, the thing is you take a coil, which has actually very, uh, very low loss, and then you put it really close to the body. And as it turns out, actually the, the body start interacting and becoming part of that, uh, that antenna. And because our body is, you know, is conductive, you know, think of it as a bag of saline, pretty much. Uh, we have uh, resistance, you know, uh, or losses in the sample associated. So when you just put it next to, you'll see that the coil um, um, uh, return loss actually more looks like this then, you know. So it broadens and, uh, you know, the amount of, uh, you know, and, and kind of, uh, it broadens because of those losses. And that has to do with the interactions to so your body becomes part of the antenna. And there's really, uh, and, and that phenomena is more significant, the larger the coil is, and also the higher the frequency is. Okay, so it's less pronounced, uh, low frequencies, more pronounced at high frequencies, less pronounced when you have a small coil, but it's more pronounced when you have a large coil. So the losses in the samples are a few. It's either dielectric losses, which are uh, in the dielectric, whatever, you know, uh, medium. Uh, you can have some losses there. That's usually negligible. And it's pretty much the induction loss that's uh, uh, due to um, uh, the fact that our body is conductive. Um, that is the, the most significant part. Um, so if you actually, um, so this graph, uh, let me try to explain to you, is uh, has to do with what is more dominant. Is the loss in the uh, sample or the loss in the coil, which one is more dominant uh, for different frequencies, uh, for different frequencies, for different coil radiuses? So um, this point over here in red emphasizes, oh, anything above here, that is pretty much the dominant source of noise comes from the sample. So let's say at 10 megahertz with a coil above about seven centimeter diameter, then uh, above that, you know, if you have a larger coil or a higher frequency, then you'll be dominated by the sample. As opposed to um, if you're actually over here, below here. So let's say, let's pick a frequency here. Um, yeah, I guess the 10 megahertz below, uh, you know, seven centimeter, you'll be dominated by the, by the coil, okay? By the coil noise. So this is kind of the line where, uh, where you have. And so if we look at kind of two interesting frequencies, 64 megahertz and 128 megahertz, this corresponds to 3T and 1.5T. Then if you have a coil above two cent, uh, larger than two centimeters, then you should be uh, pretty much in a good position uh, for having um, most of the noise, uh, you know, that you can change pretty much. You're dominated by the body noise. Uh, as opposed to being dominated by the coil noise. And that's the, actually the place that you want to be because that you cannot change. You cannot really control the body noise, but you can definitely try to improve the coil noise. Um, so in, um, in uh, uh, animal systems, often you use very small coils. You have also a very small body, so they don't load the coil enough. And they're making a, a coil that's actually cooled so to reduce its resistivity makes, uh, makes a big difference. And so sometimes you can actually uh, get those for, at 70, for example, um, uh, for animal coils, you'll have uh, these very uh, like uh, nitrogen, li uh, liquid nitrogen cooled coils um, that uh, give you higher SNR because of that. Okay. Any questions? So in a good in a good uh, in a good design, pretty much of a system, what you really want to be dominated is by uh, by the body noise because that you cannot control. That's that's pretty much the the point that I want to make. Uh, if you go below that, that means that you're now dominated by the noise generated by your system, and so you could have gotten higher SNR out of your image if you made your coil, for example, larger. Okay, so uh, that's an example. All right, so um, in terms of uh, 
in terms of the system noise, so the system noise uh, is usually proportional to uh, omega zero half. If you actually want to look at, please take a look at, uh, uh, I don't want to go in, into this, but all the derivation are in, um, in this paper by Makovsky, Al Makovsky, noise in MRI. Um, and so the, uh, this has to do with pretty much skin depth. Okay, so the higher the frequency is, so as omega zero increases, uh, then your uh, resistivity uh, increases and hence your, uh, and increases by about square root of that frequency. Um, in terms of body noise, that is a little bit more complicated, but it can be approximated as being proportional to actually the frequency squared uh, times uh, the radius of the coil to the fifth. Um, now, the, these, uh, the body noise is due to, as I said, electrical eddy currents in the body. It's really not an MRI process. It has nothing to do with MRI. It's just the fact that our body is kind of like a bag of saline. Um, so that process of generating that noise is really not localized to any uh, particular frequency in any position, right? It just comes from, from the body itself. Uh, the body cannot be cool, so uh, we must live with it. Uh, or you can kill the person and then you know, reduce the temperature, and so you don't have to live with it if you get my grip. Um, and the dependence of omega zero is due to differentiation in Faraday's law uh, is the fact that um, um, when you actually look at Faraday law, there is, uh, there is pretty much a, uh, a derivative associated with it. So this is why it's dependence on, on omega zero. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, this is pretty much the kind of the proportional, uh, you know, sigma or noise standard deviation associated with uh, our the body noise, and this one is the associated with the coil. And for body noise dominance, so dominated by the actual noise, what you really want to do is use a, either a higher field, so bigger than 0.5 tesla, um, so you move up in frequency, uh, or use a larger coil. Okay, so for example, more than one inch and at 64 megahertz will just give you body noise uh, dominance. If you, if you make a coil that's less than that, then you're, you'll be dominated by the coil noise. Okay, um, so then if you actually look at uh, um, our signal, so our signal is proportional to the magnetization. So this is the magnetization component. Uh, it is also uh, proportional um, to uh, omega zero, and pretty much you can approximate it as B zero uh, square. Um, so SNR uh, is B zero square divided by the sum, hence, um, and hence SNR, if you actually look at this, then, um, you know, this would give you, uh, you know, the square root of that. If this is the dominant component, if this is the dominant component, then square root of that pretty much will give you that SNR is proportional to B0. Okay, because this will be beta times B, and then this was B0. And so, you know, divide, you just get proportional to B0. Um, so, well designed system I, that is body noise dominance, SNR is proportional to. Um, this is a test. Uh, it's proportional to, to B0. So the question is, how would you go about and improve your SNR? So one of the ways to improve SNR is actually to make your coils smaller. And the reason to make the coil smaller is that you notice here that sigma m is actually proportional to B0 square, but also uh, you know, the radius of the coil to the fifth. So you make the coil smaller, up to body noise dominance, you'll get less, less noise. The reason is um, because if this is our body, it emits noise, but then if you have a small coil down here, then this coil not, you know, will only be sensitive to the signal coming from a small part of the volume, but it will also, because the body is the part that generates the noise, it will also be sensitive to a smaller source of noise. And hence, it would, uh, uh, your overall signal to noise ratio would improve just because the, the, the coil 
not only sees this as a smaller part of the body, but also sees uh, less noise. Okay, so making a coil smaller actually makes makes a big difference. Uh, the other one, of course, is because of this dependency on B0, you want to probably go to higher field. Albeit, when you go to higher field, there's other issues that you have to deal with. For example, T1 becomes longer, um, SAR becomes an issue, so your ability to actually heat the tissue improves as you get to the microwave frequencies, you know, so you can uh, really make the MRI uh, scanner a microwave oven if you really wanted to. Um, so that's that's pretty nice. And to be honest, even in our 3T scanner, every time somebody runs a localizer and I sit inside, I feel like this warmth in my in my stomach. Like you can actually can feel the heat being dissipated inside your body. It's pretty comforting, but at the same time freaks me out every time. Uh, but it's a nice feeling because like, oh wow, it's like a nice oven. Mm -hmm. I hope it will stop at some point so I don't have to sweat. All right, so um, let's look now at the situation with image, okay? Um, so the MR signal at baseband, and when I say baseband, it basically means that the, not, the demodulated signal, right? Like whatever, uh, whatever signal that you have at 128 megahertz, you demodulate at, uh, to, uh, to DC, and then whatever you're, you're left, that's a signal, that's the baseband. So, at baseband, uh, our signal is, uh, is composed of the uh, MR signal plus some noise, okay? So S of T is our signal, N of T is the noise. Uh, because we do what's called quadrature detection, I talked about it briefly, but pretty much our signal is complex valued, right? We talked about why it is complex valued, but so is, will be the noise. The noise will also be complex valued. And so, um, Effectively, we have a noise, which is a bivariate Gaussian. So it has a real, a real component or an in-phase component and it has a quadrature component. Okay, so it's a bivariate Gaussian. Um, and its power spectral density um, is pretty much the same for the in-phase and the quadrature channels. Pretty much there's no distinction between them. And it's sigma square times the um, whatever, um, uh, your bandwidth is. So if you have a low pass filter, um, so that, that would depend on, you know, how much you're going to filter. So this is the um, frequency response of your, of your low pass filter. Okay. Uh, but it pretty much is a, is a white Gaussian noise over a certain bandwidth. Uh, white Gaussian bivariate, right? So it has two components. Okay, so um, let's take a look what is the impact of noise on the 2DFT or 3DFT? So pretty much Cartesian trajectories, okay? So if you collect K-space, so K-space has data, but it's also will be contaminated with that bivariate wide gash okay, in K-space. Now, how do you go and reconstruct 2DFT or 3DFT sequences? You pretty much apply an FFT, an inverse FFT. Uh, well, Turns out that FFT is a unitary operation. And hence, if you have a uh, white bi uh, bivariate Gaussian in the frequency domain and you apply an FFT or an inverse FFT to it, you end up also with a bivariate white Gaussian. So it really doesn't change the noise statistics. It depends how, what type of FFT you're using. Uh, you know, it might amplify, you know, like there's gonna be a scaling associated with it. But the scaling would apply to the signal as well as the noise in the same way, so it's not going to affect SNR whatsoever. Okay, so um, so the SNR will be exactly the same after this unitary operation. Now, if you have a non-uniform trajectory like radial and spiral, well, then that is not true anymore. Um, then you're not using an FFT or regular FFT in order to do this. You're using a non-uniform FFT, which is not orthogonal. And since it's not orthogonal, you're gonna have uh, actually colored noise. It's still gonna be Gaussian. Uh, however, it's gonna be colored. It's gonna have different noise level and different frequencies associated with, with the radial or you know, sp spiral sampling. So that can cost you some SNR when you use those trajectories and you have to be aware of that. And also the noise in the image will look a little bit different. 
uh, it will have kind of more like a, a little bit structure to it because uh, it's, it has uh, lower frequencies in it. Um, uh, one comment is that um, we often look at magnitude images, right? Like when you actually look and reconstruct a DICOM, you will display the image. So the image will be displayed as, uh, you know the uh, absolute value of the uh, of of the pixel value, and since the pixel value actually has signal component as well as noise component, you're going to take the a magnitude operation, which is a nonlinear operation. Hence, the noise statistics of a magnitude image is actually non-Gaussian anymore. Okay, because of that operation, um, there's actually two cases we can distinguish. One is when you actually have no background pixel. When you have no background pixel, then, um, then pretty much um, after you take a magnitude operation, then the noise level is just going to depend on you know, uh, how far you are. Let's say uh, you, know, you end up getting this noise value. So this is the real part, and this is the imaginary part of the noise, right? After taking a magnitude operation, then, uh, then your noise is actually uh, going to have just a length associated with it, right? So uh, that's why I drew these contours because it doesn't matter if your noise is here or here or here or here, it will be exactly the same, right? Uh, after taking a magnitude operation. Okay, so the, the direction or the phase of it does, doesn't matter. You know, it goes away after computing a magnitude operation. So in that case, your distribution turns out is going to move from being Gaussian to what's called a Riley distribution. And I think a Riley distribution kind of looks like, um, what does a Riley distribution look like? Does it look like that? It's one-sided. Um, yeah, something like that. I forget. But it's a one-sided distribution as opposed to be, uh, being a Gaussian, which is a you know double-sided distribution, right? Um, so this is a Riley distribution for when the background uh, signal pixel is zero, uh, is zero. When the background pixel is not zero, then you got yourself a signal plus in addition to that you've got noise, right? But really. Um, um, the, the result of that noise uh, is actually quite interesting, right? Because uh, for example, uh, in terms of magnitude, any, any noise that pushes you in these directions will actually not contribute to change in magnitude, right? So if, if you, you have a noise that's kind of like lies on, on this arc, you know, you'll get exactly the same magnitude. Um, so the distribution is, uh, for this noise is called Rycian. It's a complicated distribution. Um, and you know, it's, it's something that we don't really usually like to work with. Uh, but turns out actually that if your magnitude is actually very large, then, um, then you can actually approximate that noise of being Gaussian because really, um, really just noise in this, in this direction, sorry, I'm going to use this color. In this direction and this direction are going to make any effect on the magnitude, uh, whereas any uh, tangent, you know, noise that moves you to tangent direction doesn't. And so uh, you can kind of approximate this operation as being, uh, as being Gaussian. So a large M, uh, approximately Gaussian. When M is non-zero, but not too large, then it's really, Ricean distribution, so you have to really use that one. And when the background is zero, then the distribution is uh, is Riley. Okay. That's a question. Yeah. You got a couple different M's in the slide on the top line. What's I, don't know. I what's think it's the same M. M. It's the same M. This is the Im This is the signal, the image. Small M is the image. N is the noise. Um, and so when uh, the mean signal or M is zero, then N would be Riley distributed. When M is not zero, M plus N, so the noise plus the signal, 
will be this Ricean distributed. And then when M is large, then M plus N would be pretty much Gaussian distributed approximately. M is signal, N is noise, okay. Yeah. M is the signal uh, in that pixel, and then N is the noise. Okay. So, um, yeah, often we just you know ignore this part and just look at the situations where M is large enough, so then people approximate as Gaussian. And I have to say that sometimes people uh, want to compute signal to noise ratio. They'll take a DICOM image, and then they'll go in the background and mark a circle there, and then uh, compute the standard deviation. Now, what they don't realize is actually computing the standard deviation of a Riley distributed signal, which is not the same as the Gaussian distributed one. And so uh, there is some compensation that you have to apply in order to really understand what would actually what was actually the noise uh, level uh, for the Gaussian process. Uh, and adjust for it. Because then they'll go to the signal, they measure the signal level, and then they go like, oh, this is the SNR. You take the signal, the average signal, and then divide by the noise standard deviation that you get SNR, but that is not true if you're using it on DICOM images. So you have to do some compensation there in order to really get the SNR. Okay. So um, don't do that mistake. Uh, compute SNR off DICOM images, that's not great. All right, so now is actually a very important piece of information that we're gonna go through. And we're gonna now try to understand what is the SNR dependence on sequence parameters, okay? Um, and this is really crucial because if you carefully manage the signal, uh, the sequence parameters, uh, you can really maintain SNR and get really good images. But if you make some mistake there, you can quickly get pretty nasty looking images. So you, you've got to, as, as, as somebody that uses a scanner, then it's really important to be able to track, uh, you know, how a change that I'm going to make now into a, a prescription is going to change my SNR. Okay. Um, so the first thing, first parameter we're going to look at is acquisition time. And for this analysis, uh, we're going to assume a few things. First of all, we're going to assume a constant resolution, right? So uh, we're going to freeze the resolution to be constant on all acquisitions that we're going to do. Okay, that, that is a critical thing that we're going to apply. Um, now, the other, the other assumption we're going to make is pretty much that our object that our, we're imaging is an impulse object at the center of the magnet, which has a signal strength A, okay, that will be our object, but we will see how it will change and how SNR will change based on this. We're also gonna assume N readout samples. So the number of samples that we're gonna collect along the readout direction uh, is gonna be um, N. And the noise variance per sample is sigma N squared, okay? So each sample that we collect is contaminated with Gaussian noise that has a standard uh, or a variance of sigma n squared. All right, so here's the case for uh, a simple 1D case. In a sim simple 1D case, um, you know, we collect samples in the frequency domain, okay? How many we collect? We collect n samples. Okay, this is Kx, and we just collect one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, what is our actual signal? Well, if you have an object, which is length A, and it's an impulse object, and the frequency domain is gonna have an amplitude A, uh, but it's gonna be everywhere in K space, pretty much constant throughout K space, right? Because the Fourier transform an impulse is a constant, okay? Yes? All right. So pretty much at every sample over here, I collect the value A, and I also collect some noise with, uh, with a variance of sigma n squared. Okay, every single measurement. Then I'm gonna compute an inverse FFT. 
So the inverse f of t, what I will get is a pixel, which is a value n times a. The value is n times a, uh, because uh, that will be the inverse DFD of, of that. Okay. All right. So what is the SNR? Well, the SNR, um, the SNR would be uh, pretty much how much signal do we have is n times a. And the question is really, what is the noise standard deviation? Well, um, if I have, n times, so how much noise I have here? Well, the amount of noise is n times sigma n squared. That's the variance of the noise because, uh, you know, it just adds like, the, you know, we added, we added all of these to get the signal, then variances also add when you add noise together. Okay, so when I sum, uh, when I sum n, I, that's the noise, um, you know, that will be distributed, it's going to be Gaussian distributed with, um, so normal distributed with zero mean and noise standard deviation, uh, nor, uh, noise variance of n times uh, sigma n squared. All right, so this is our standard deviation of the noise, uh, sorry, this, this is the variance of the noise, and the standard deviation is just going to be um, Na divided by the square root of N uh, delta N squared. So uh, the result I'm going to have is square root of N times A over sigma. And that is going to be our SNR reference. So square root of N times A divided by sigma. Ricky? Yeah. You said this, you said this is standard deviation. You meant to say SNR, right? Well, oh, sorry. This is the SNR. At the bottom, I've got the noise standard deviation. So SNR is the signal divided by the noise standard deviation. Standard deviation of the noise is square root of n times uh, sigma n squared. And so if you actually look at the SNR, is, sigma, uh, is square root of n times a divided by sigma. Okay, the, and that's our SNR reference. Everything is going to be now with reference to this. So we're going to change things now and see how the SNR changed with respect to this, okay? Ready? Okay. All right. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna average two signals, okay? So we're gonna collect an image and then we're gonna collect the same image again and we're gonna average those or pretty much add, not, I mean, when I said average, pretty much mean add those two images together. It doesn't mean the the dividing by two doesn't 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 make any difference whatsoever because it's going to divide both the noise and the um, and the image and the signal. So that's so we're just going to add them together. In that case, our signal is going to be two times Na. Okay, we're going to get twice the signal because we're adding two images. And our noise variance is going to be two times n times sigma n squared, right? Because variances add when you add noise. Okay. So the SNR is going to be two times n a divided by the square root of two times n times sigma n squared. Hence, I'm going to have an improvement of square root of two compared to um, the case where I collected one in. Okay, so averaging or collecting two images and adding them together, I will have an improvement of square root of two with uh, the, or square root actually the number of averages. So if you actually do it for uh, an arbitrary number of averages, then SNR will be proportional to the square root of the number of averages times the SNR of the reference. So averaging, buys you square root of the number of averages. Pretty nice. Okay, not great, but you know, that's, that's what it is. Okay. Now, the other thing that I'm gonna look now, so uh, obviously there's an issue there, right? Like uh, we want to improve our SNR by a factor of two, for example. 
And what does it mean in terms of the number of averages that I need to collect? Four images, right? So let's say one image takes me one minute to collect. Then now in order to improve my SNR by a factor of two, now I have to wait four minutes. You know, one minute didn't sound that bad for some of you, but four minutes, you know, it's getting there. That's, that's, uh, that's quite, you know, that's getting there. Like, oh, what am I gonna do for four minutes? You know, it's like, uh, just wait, wait, wait. Okay, so that, that is, the, that is uh, one situation. Now, what I wanna look at is case number two, where we uh, don't do number of averages, but we increase the readout time. Now, if you remember, you know, a pulse sequence, you know, a pulse sequence is, uh, is something like this, right? It's like you have, a, you know, some RF, right? And then you have a slice selection, and then you have a phasing code, and then you have a readout, right? And then you wait for a very long time and then you repeat, right? And then basically this, this is a TR, right? And then you repeat and this, this would be a TR, time repetition. And because of the nature of MR, you know, this time is usually very short compared to the TR. TR is usually much longer than the time that we collect the data. So it's quite inefficient in some way. So the question is really if I, um, want to traverse the same amount of case space. Let me just try to erase that somehow. I want to traverse the same amount of case space, right? Then, you know, based on my gradients, I, you know, I go up here and then I collect one line and that length of time that I collect on uh, this line depends on the strength of the gradient. If the gradient is strong, I'm gonna traverse this very fast. If the gradient is weaker, I'm gonna traverse this more slowly, right? And so this is exactly what I'm, I wanna do now. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to traverse this part of the case space at half the speed. And when I do that, the question is how is that gonna affect the SNR? Okay. Now I'm going to ignore now all the artifacts associated, for example, T2 star decay and all that kind of stuff. Remember, those could be an issue. But let's say those are not an issue right now. Okay. So without T2 star, without this, um, you know, what would happen if I actually slow down my acquisition? Okay. All right. Well, uh, in that case, um, you know, this is my X gradient and pretty much I'm going to assign a Delta T, which is my sampling period. Uh, this is Delta T and then I'm going to change and then I have a certain gradient amplitude. I'm going to half my gradient amplitude and I'm going to keep exactly the number of samples that I've collected, right? Like I'm collecting N number of samples in case space. Well, I'm going to collect N number of samples here except that those N number of samples is going to be a co collected over two Delta T, okay? Now it's not that I'm skipping time points. It's I'm actually have a low pass filter that would kind of uh, lower the bandwidth and then I'm gonna sample it at that interval. So it's not just skipping, you know, it's not just skipping time. It's uh, I have some also low pass operation that, that's done before, right? Remember that there's always a low pass operation. So this, the whole time here is two T read, this is two delta T and so on and so forth. So just from a summary point of view, um, my T read, that's the time I spend reading is twice as long. My gradient is half, right? So the gradient amplitude is half because if it wasn't half, I would have gotten higher resolution, right? Like I would, if my gradient would have kept the same and it's just twice as long, then I pretty much would cover, uh, you know, more of case space, like twice. That means that it's a higher resolution, but we said we're gonna keep the resolution the same. So I have to play a half a grain. The time I spent for each sample is two Delta T. My sampling rate is half the sampling rate, uh, but also my bandwidth is also half because 
um, I don't need that high of a bandwidth. And so I can actually low pass it, low pass filter even further and then uh, sample at half the rate, right? So uh, my half is the bandwidth, bandwidth is half. The resolution is the same as proportional to n, okay? Um, so these are the same. All right, so now let's do the analysis. So my signal, nothing pretty much changes there. It's still gonna be an A, right? Every time that I collect a sample is just, uh, you know, I get an A, 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 A. It doesn't matter what, right? So that doesn't change. The question is, what is the variance of the noise that I'm actually collecting? Well, the variance will be n times sigma n squared, but remember that my bandwidth is halved. And since my bandwidth is halved, then also the noise uh, variance is halved in the same way, right? Because there's just less bandwidth. The low pass filter actually cuts out some of the, some of the noise. And so, uh, because the bandwidth of the pixel is half, then uh, my noise standard deviation is also, uh, my noise variance is also half. Okay. So now I can actually do the SNR analysis. Uh, my SNR is going to be the signal, which is n times a, divided by square root of n over two times sigma n squared. And pretty much the result I'm getting is square root of two improvement. I acquired twice the number of measurement, like twice the time, I get pretty much improvement of square root. So pretty much SNR is proportional to the square root of my readout time. That's ignoring T2 star, of course. You know, any signal decay, of course, will, you know, will affect that. So there is improvement, the fact that I reduced uh, my gradient and also reduced the bandwidth of the bandwidth per pixel, okay? Reducing the bandwidth per pixel by reducing the gradient will improve my signal to noise ratio uh, because again, my low pass filter will remove a lot of that noise. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, one consequence is again, the frequency domain, like in the actually for it, like in the frequency domain, if my signal has a certain bandwidth, right? Like associated with it. And that is proportional to the gradient. If I apply a strong gradient, you know, whatever is far away from the center will have high for higher frequency compared to if I have a weaker gradient, it will have less frequencies. Okay. So uh, when I have a certain gradient amplitude, then I will also have a bandwidth associated with it. And then I'm going to be then sensitive to all the noise that is in within the bandwidth. But when I scale my gradient down, then all my signal now is going to be concentrated in a smaller bandwidth. And hence, I'm just gonna be affected by the noise in that, in that bandwidth. Okay, so, so reducing the gradient, improving, you know, lengthening, lengthening the readout time gives me uh, improvement in SNR, but at what expense? I said one thing, sensitivity to T2 star. Any other thing? It's related to T2 star, but what happens with chemical shift? It's getting worse. It's getting worse, right? Because you read for a very long time, so phase due to chemical shift the cruise and you get more shift, right? It gets worse. Because your bandwidth per pixel uh, is reduced. Hence, if you have a deviation in frequency, you're gonna get more geometric distortions. Okay, so it, you know, there's always trade-offs. Your gradient is reduced, hence you're gonna be more sensitive to inhomogeneities. Okay, so, uh, but you can buy yourself a significant amount of SNR by doing that. So it's like, you know. Okay. So what we got so far is that the SNR is pretty much proportional to the total read time. You know, whether you average 
or whether you, uh, you, you turn on your uh, readout window, increase it, it's pretty much proportional to the square root of the total read time. Uh, and in 2DFT, S and R will be then proportional to the square root of the number of averages, the number of phasing codes, and the time that you spend reading in each DR. Right? The more phasing code I have, you know, the more reads I will have, and hence my S and R would also increase. So another way of you know, improving your SNRs, for example, is have more phasing codes. For example, with twice the field of view of your image, we'll still improve your SNR by a factor of square root of two. And you'll get like a lot of black around your image, but it's like, who cares? Uh, it's, you can crop it afterwards, okay? So these are the ways to increase uh, SNR. Uh, this one doesn't really change a uh, lot the uh, total scan time, whereas these, uh, you know, directly affect the scan time. Does that make sense? All right, any questions? Okay, let's go to some examples. Let's consider uh, these two cases. Um, this is uh, the read time, and we collect 256 samples, and then this is exactly the same read time, but instead of collecting 256 samples, we collect 512 samples. And the question is, what is the relative SNR between the two? Not obvious. Or is it obvious? Well, it's obvious if you, if, you, if you know MR, but if you don't know MR, then it's not as obvious. So let's try to understand kind of what's going on here. What does it mean to read 512 samples with, uh, with fixed readout? What does it mean about your bandwidth? Like your, you know, your low pass filter. I mean, basically my delta T is, is, is half in here, right? So my low pass filter has to be twice as wide. So I'm gonna be a little bit more noise here, but then I get more samples. So maybe you know, I would need to do the calculation. Okay, so each sample here is gonna contaminate with more noise, but I have more samples than this. So let's see what I have. So in the first case, so the, the answer is basically is the same. It actually doesn't change. And the way to see it is if you look at the first case, I have 256 times A divided by square root of 256 times sigma n squared. Okay, that's my SNR reference. And so square root of 256a divided by square root of, uh, by, by uh, sigma n. In the second case, I've got 512 times a, so 512 measurements. But then what is my noise standard deviation? Well, the noise standard deviation is, uh, or the noise variance, sorry, um, is first of all, 512, 512 because I have more samples times, well, what? Well, it is sigma n squared, but remember the bandwidth is doubled, so I have also twice. Uh, my my uh, noise uh, variance is actually twice as high. So uh, I get more samples, but also the bandwidth is doubled. So uh, effectively, I've got square root of 512a divided by square root of two times sigma n, and that uh, actually that's ended up being exactly the same as here as SNR, the same as SNR one. So nothing has changed. The other way of actually looking at this is saying, you know what? You, it doesn't matter how fast I sample. I get like the fastest A is ADC. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's the total time that I've collected data. That makes sense. Like it doesn't matter if I, if I sample fast or not sample fast, as long as there's no alias, right? Uh, so because the time that I've collected here and the time I collected here 
is the same, then my SNR will be the same, no matter how fast I sample. If I fast sample too fast, well, I mean, it just gives give me more bandwidth, but like who, you know, but then my, my, uh, I get I get more bandwidth, right? But like, so what? Okay, it's not gonna change my signal to noise ratio. It's really the total time that makes the difference. And so just really is a really good rule of thumb here is you just need to count how much time is being data is being collected and that's it as long as you as you do that i can play with you oh sampling rate that and sampling rate that. it doesn't matter just look at how much total time is being collected and that you that will give you the relative smr here's a slightly different case okay that's also very interesting this is a pure phase encoded acquisition and the sequence is the following um, we're just gonna collect data along Y direction. So just gradient in Y. Every TR, we're gonna play a different phasing code. And then we're collect at the end of the TR or like immediately after the phasing code, we're gonna collect one sample. Okay, so excite, do one phasing code, read one sample. Wait, so on and so forth, excite, do another phasing code, read one sample. So 256 phasing codes and collect one sample each. And then the other case would be 512 of these, collect one sample at the end. Okay. And we're collecting here with a larger field of view pretty much. So they're dense, they're not collecting higher, higher resolution, but pretty much just the higher field of view. Okay. And so the question is, what is the relative SNR between here and here. And I'm actually uh, missing here a few things. If this is Kx, then, uh, then Kx would look like that. Sorry, Ky with 256 samples. And this is uh, also Ky. And here I have 512 samples. And we're collecting exactly the same uh, area of K space, but here we sample more densely. So kind of similar to the previous case, but not exactly the same. And the question is, what is the relative SNR? Anybody has an idea? Let's, let's do the calculation. What is the signal here in this image? What's the signal? Two, five, six times A, right? That's the signal. What is the noise variance? divided by the square root of the variance. What is the variance? It's 256 times sigma n squared, right? Okay. What about this case? What is the sigma? What's the signal? 512 times A. 512 times A. And what is the noise density? <sighs> yeah, and what is the noise standard deviation? The square root of the 512 times the... Square root of 512, that's right, because if you remember, we the amount of time that we collect is exactly the same here and here, right? So the noise is the same, right? So square root of 512 times sigma n squared, okay? So if I track that, uh, then SNR1 is 256a divided by square root of 256 times that, and SNR2 will be 512a divided by square root of 512 times sigma n squared. And so this would actually have an improvement of 
square root of two of over S and R1. So there is an improvement by doing 512. Now, what is the scan time in the second, second case? Well, scan time is actually doubled because you have 512 repetition phasing codes, right? So the SNR uh, is improved, but at the expense of doubling the scan time. So remember that in the phasing code direction, adding more phasing code improves your SNR, okay? At the expense, of course, of scan time. Adding more samples in the readout doesn't. Changing the readout length does, okay? Does that make sense? Those are great midterm three questions. Okay, so before you study for midterm two, um, then just remember in midterm three, we're gonna talk about SNR. Okay. All right, that was SNR. Now let's talk about another important thing, which is the spatial resolution. Now we all love resolution. We like to see these really fine structures, right? Like, oh, oh wow, this image is so sharp and you know has all this features in it, right? We love it. So what we're gonna do now is try to analyze what is the effect of resolution on the signal to noise ratio and see how problematic that can actually be in MRI. Okay, actually quite very problematic, fortunately. Now, the analysis that we're gonna do here is slightly different, okay? Um, we're gonna assume, and this is again, we follow the book in, the, in here, is we're gonna assume that the readout and scan times are fixed. So we're not gonna change now the scan time because changing the scan time and the readout length you know, changes S and R, right? So we're gonna fix those. Those are gonna stay the same. We're still gonna assume and read out sam uh, samples and also sigma N squared variance per sample. <coughs> but now we're gonna use a slightly different object, an object which is more realistic, okay? Um, and this object is, uh, is gonna be one dimensional and its Fourier transform is going to be A times some uh, rect that is W sub KX wide, okay? So our object has a value A in a width of W sub KX and it's zero outside in K space. Now, why is that? a reasonable model. Well, if you actually look at the distribution of images in K-space, you'll see a very strong signal in the low frequencies and then it's actually decaying and the high frequencies is a very weak signal, right? Um, and so we, we wanna model that somehow. Okay, we wanna model the fact that the signal is very low at high frequencies compared to uh, low frequencies. And so uh, the way we're gonna model this is actually approximate as a rect. Okay, with some bandwidth. So pretty much our, our image has a certain bandwidth and outside of that is zero. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. And again, we're gonna reconstruct now the signal at the origin. And then, uh, and then uh, if we do that, then our SNR ref is going to be square root of N times A over uh, sigma N, like in the same way, like nothing would have changed because we still collect you know, n samples over this region and then you know, the result is gonna be the same. This is our reference SNR, okay? Um, okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the effect of doubling the gradient. If you double the gradient, um, what it will do, it would, and keep, keep the same number of, um, uh, keep the same, again, same number of samples uh, we said, right? And also what else we said, uh, and the readout time, right? It, that stays the same. So doubling the gradient will actually reduce our field of view by half, right? 
because now we go twice as fast throughout k space. But also, it would uh, reduce the size of each pixel by half, right? Because we're collecting more of k space. So it's reducing delta x by half. Okay. So effectively, what we're going to do is start collecting data far away in k space. So uh, over here and here, and then collect half the samples during, uh, you know, this period, and then uh, again, uh, so quarter of a sample, half the samples, and then another quarter, right? Total. And the question is now, what is our SNR? So each one of those measurements is contaminated with noise, no matter if your high frequencies or low frequencies, the same noise. So our noise standard deviation doesn't really change. It's still going to be n times sigma n squared. But because we collected more high frequencies and our object actually doesn't have much signal in the high frequencies, then effectively we collected kind of zeros over here, right? Like we're not, we're collecting more, you know, mostly noise here. And here we spend only n over two number of points collecting a samples and the rest are zero. So our signal is n over two times a. So the SNR is n over two times a divided by square root of n times sigma n squared. And pretty much I've got half of my SNR. So reducing my voxel size, my pixel size by a factor of two would also give me a reduction in SNR of a factor of two. Okay. Ouch. Okay, well, that's fine. I got like, a, you know, I, I got an image. I did, I did a mistake. I collected, you know, twice the resolution, you know, um, I got a really noisy image. So what I want to do now is in post-processing, I collected the data, but I said, you know what? How about I'll just reduce my resolution back to what originally it was from the data I collected. I collected the high resolution. I can now filter it and reduce its resolution by a factor of two in order to buy back the SNR that I lost. All right, let's try to do that and see what happens. So our reference is, you know, n samples acquired here, right? That's the sample. The acquired data now is, you know, I collected n over samples over that range where a exists and then zero, like uh, and, and, n over two samples outside, right? That's what I had. Okay, so I got this data, it's two of a high resolution. I got a problem now, right? So my SNR is not very good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply a filter, right? In K space and pretty much throw away those measurements that were just noise, pure noise, right? And reduce my resolution and improve my SNR. And the question is, what is the SNR? Well, the signal is still N over two times A. Right, because that's that's what I have. The variance now is reduced, right? It's n over two times sigma n squared. Okay. Well, if you actually do the calculation, you see that, well, I got one over square root of two times the SNR of the reference. So now I end up with exactly the same resolution of the reference, but I lost square root of two of SNR because of my prescription. This is a dire consequence. That means that you really have to be a good MR technician or MR tech when you're actually prescribing a, uh, a scan because if you don't prescribe the right resolution ahead, if you try to compensate for that resolution in post-processing, you're not gonna get exactly the same signal as uh, the same SNR as collecting re that resolution from the beginning. Does that make sense? It's a dire consequence. It's, it's, it's not true, by the way, for CT. CT, it's okay. You, you know, like, like a, a CT technician, you go like, well, I don't know what resolution to do. I'm just gonna do like one micron. So it collects one micron. Oh, I can't see anything. Okay, well, let's average it out to like 100 micron. Ah, I can't still see anything. 
Oh, keep averaging. Uh, okay, one, now it's one millimeter. Oh, now I can see something. Okay. If, if that technician would have collected a CT image with one millimeter resolution in the first place, it will be exactly the same as collecting one micron and then averaging to one millimeter. That will be the same. I, I don't want to get into like why, but that's, that's the case for CT. For MR, it's not the same. For MR, if I now want to have a one millimeter resolution and I'm going to collect now half a millimeter resolution and then average it out to be one millimeter, I'm, I'm going to lose SNR, a square root of that, compared to just collecting uh, one millimeter in the, you know, directly. Does that make sense? That's a dire consequence of, of MR, and you have to therefore select your resolution carefully up front, because otherwise it's going to cost you. You can improve what you get, but you cannot improve as if you would have collected that resolution in the first place. There's an object domain perspective to the same phenomena. So what I can do is pretty much look at a signal per voxel. And the signal per voxel is pretty much reduced linearly because the number of spins is just less. So if I have you know, smaller voxels, there's just linearly less spins there. And so my signal will be reduced, but the noise is the same. The noise doesn't change. The noise I collect from the entire volume, you know, I collect from the, from the, it's not localized to a particular position, right? The noise. Um, so effectively, if I, uh, so the SNR is just proportional to the voxel size. This is a really good rule of thumb, okay? So if I have some uh, voxel size uh, with S signal, then the SNR will be proportional to S. That's the number of spins inside. If I break that into four pixels now, I've got S over four spins in each one of those voxels. So my SNR is going to be proportional to S over four. Okay, the noise that I'm getting is exactly the same. So it's just to have less signal in each pixel. Okay, so SNR is reduced. Okay, it's a really good rule of thumb, except in some situations. And like everything, it depends, right? Like, you know. So here's a situation where it's different. Let's say you have a situation that your object is actually smaller than the resolution that you're imaging. So this represents the size of the pixel, but really the spins are concentrated in just a smaller part of it. Okay, that, that kind of makes sense. Let's say this is a tissue and the tissue is black, but this is a blood vessel. So the blood vessel you know, is a smaller size than the object. So the number of spins is S tilde. The size of the voxel is S. So the SNR is actually proportional to S tilde. If I then go ahead and improve my resolution, you know, go at a higher resolution, well, yeah, so each, each voxel here is S over four, but but still the SNR, you know, the, the amount of signal that comes from this voxel is still S tilde. So the SNR for this voxel is, doesn't change, even though I went and I improved my resolution by a factor of two. Okay, does that make sense? But that is a very special situation. And, and, and that, the model for that is actually this case. If my object is very small, I can think of my object as being an impulse function. And therefore, it would actually have a much higher support in the frequency domain. And hence, collecting more of the frequency will actually still collect signal. It's not like this case where it's not collecting, uh, it's not like this case when it's not collecting a signal because my resolution is much higher for that particular feature. Actually, even when I collect those samples, I will collect A because my object is more spread out in the frequency domain. That's what it means. Okay, so you have to take things with a little bit of a grain of salt when you do this rule of thumbs of, uh, of uh, of you know what is the SNR versus resolution, but you have to understand, you know what is the features that you're actually looking at. 
but it's pretty good rule of thumb. You know, reduce the voxel size, you know, SNR reduces linearly with the voxel size and then increases square root with the scan time or the, your A to D time. Okay. So in general, SNR is proportional to many things. This is sequence parameters and then square root of the A to D time and then linearly with the size of your voxels. Okay. Uh, this is pretty much the magnetization level. This is how long you collect data. And this is how many spins you have in a voxel. Other vector, for example, is the uniformity of case space. And I mentioned that when you have Cartesian case space, it's more efficient than having a radial case space because here you're collecting you know, more samples than you actually really need. And so you'll have to weight them down. So you're pretty much wasting time collecting those measurements as if you could have collected other measurements that you didn't have. So that's, that's kind of the argument there. But you end up with pretty much having colored noise as opposed to, you know. Okay, so um, I'm gonna steal five minutes just because, because I can um, and because um, I, I, I wanna finish this. So uh, here's an SNR example. Resolution is 256 by 256. That's SNR 100. What is the SNR after doubling the resolution? So higher resolution, okay, of an image. Okay, well, um, SNR is proportional to, you know, your signal and then square root of, uh, you know, the time. And then uh, when you have the resolution of the 256 by 256, then basically you have delta X over two, delta Y over two, delta Z doesn't change because our slice is, has not changed. We're just talking about a 2D image. And so I'm gonna get an SNR of 25, pretty much, okay? So quarter of my SNR because my voxel size or my pixel size are now quarter of what they were in the beginning. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay. Resolution is 256 by 256 spin warp. So 2DFD. SNR is 100. Now we take only 128 phase encodes. So half the resolution in Y. Just half the resolution in Y, same resolution in X. And we do that by collecting 128 phase encodes. What is the SNR? Okay, so uh, let's think. Um, let's see, what is our A to D time? Half, right? Because we only collect 128 phase encodes as opposed to 256. So our T is half. Okay, our total time, T A to D, T A to D is halved. What about the resolution? Why in the y direction, I have double, you know, twice the size of the pixels, right? So delta y is pretty much two delta y, right? And the rest is the same. Okay. So in terms of SNR, you know, my number of spins is the same. I got square root of T A to D time, which is divided by two. Delta X is the same, delta Y is doubled. And so I actually have an improvement of square root in SNR. Why? Because my voxel size in the Y direction are twice as large. That should have given me improvement of factor of two. However, my scan time is reduced by a factor of two. Then I lost the square root of two. So overall, I just gained square root of two. Okay. So my SNR will be Approximately one four one four four two, you know, one forty one. Square root of two times one hundred. Okay, how many averages needed for the same SNR after doubling the resolution in all that all three dimensions? 
Okay. So I improve, I make smaller voxels in all three directions. And I want to know how many averages I need to do in order to get exactly the same SNR. Okay, you're going to do that in the lab. Okay, so my voxel size now is decreased by factor of eight. Okay, two in all direction. And the question is, this times square root of ta to d2 should be equal to square root of ta to d1. Okay, so uh, what I get pretty much is if this is reduced by a factor of eight, in order to gain back my SNR, ta to d2 needs to be 64 times ta to a to b of one. 64 times. So somebody tells you, it's like, oh, just get twice the, you know, twice the voxel size, you know, in each direction. That's not a problem, right? Like, to, you know, reduce it. Oh, you only lose eight fold SNR, which will just cost you 64 times the averaging time in order to get it back, right? So if you have a one minute scan, that very quickly turns out into an hour. So going from 0.5 millimeter or 500 microns to 100 microns doesn't sound so different, but it's a factor of five in each dimension. That's five to the third, 75, it's 125, right? And 125, so that would cost you how much? Uh, 125 squared, right? which is 15,625. Yeah, so going from 500 microns to 100 micron isotropic, you'll need to average 15,625 times in order to gain back the same signal to noise ratio. And that's not a joke. That is a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, so pretty expensive scan. All right. I have a question. So, yep. So you said not to actually measure SNR on a DICOM by um, looking at yeah. noise in the background. What, what's the yeah. best way to measure SNR in an image? Um, the best way is to uh, collect an image and then collect a pure noise image. That's the best way. And if you just a single, if it's just a single image, actually, it doesn't doesn't require much. You just need uh, to collect like one one uh, you know one phasing code, for example, without excitation, and then measure the noise standard deviation. That will give you a good estimate of what is the noise standard deviation, and then you can from that compute SNR. Okay, and then why why is it different than just doing it? Oh, because the noise is over the whole image. Yeah, yeah. the noise is, is the same as a whole image. So, so you if, can't, if you, you can't measure SNR on the first image that had some signal in it. If you have a, a you know a signal, then that it's so hard to you know to separate. So you gotta yeah. be careful. You can't see so all that, the noise. So what they do actually scanners, what they do is actually they collect noise and they store it within the file and the raw data. And they'll tell you what is the noise standard deviation for that for that scan, and then you could compute from that SNR pretty easily. Um, that's very common. When you're doing multiple coils, then that could be more complicated because how you combine the data from all these coils make a difference on SNR too. And there's a wonderful paper by um, um, by Peter Kelman actually. Um, that uh, that talks about how to measure uh, SNR in those cases. Okay, and there's there's several methods that you know to do that, and each one of them, you know, depends. We'll talk more about that uh, when we talk about parallel imaging and multiple coils. All right. So now we've finished SNR. Next next lecture, um, what we're going to do is uh, the first thirty minutes or twenty minutes actually. I'm just gonna continue on and talk a little bit about SNR in uh, 2D uh, and then 3D, uh, like multi-slice and, and 3D imaging. 
and a little bit of a hard of my hard of, head of margin coding. So we'll talk briefly about that. And then if we have time, uh, we're gonna do some uh, artifact. Uh, uh, it's called the artifact show. But it's kind of like a, who wants to be a millionaire, but I'll show you artifacts and you kind of try to guess what, what the artifact, what the sources are. And then uh, Shreyas uh, will then join and then uh, do his uh, magic and then uh, talk about that. So I really highly recommend coming uh, and showing up in person next uh, next uh, lecture and to hear Shreyas. It's pretty much, it's gonna be phenomenal. So usually is. Yes. Um, so it's always nice to see what's the radiologist's perspective okay, and how to look at images and uh, do diagnosis actually. All right, and then uh, feel free to ask Shreyas like lots of questions. All right. See you all in uh, on Thursday. Recording has stopped. <laughs>